I'm a little shocked at how sad I am that this is the last night. I'm telling you, I have so, I have so enjoyed studying and preparing for this. Let me tell you why. Not because I just think I'm so wonderful that I have this little great one message thing that I want to do. But I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt, this is taking us to a whole nother level. I know it. Because when you think about the throne room of God, he has thousands of angels, 24 hours, 7 days, whatever, for all eternity, surrounding his throne, crying, holy, holy, holy. How much do we have to be holy in order to be in his throne room? To think about, you're singing, I'm going to glory to glory. I'm going higher and higher. Folks, we've got to be holy to get to that. Which means not just holy as I don't, I don't do this or I don't do that. But my heart is right. My attitude is right. There is no prejudice in me. There is no unforgiveness in me. There is no rejection in me. There is nothing in me that is going to hinder the flow of the anointing in me and through me. So I know these are strategic for what God is going to do and where he is going to take us. And I cannot thank you enough for showing up in the middle of the week. It lets me know, it lets everybody know, it lets God know that your hearts are hungry for whatever he wants. Amen? And you're ready to do whatever it takes in order to get there. Come on, aren't you ready? Tonight's going to be a life-changing night because we're going to seal this thing once and for all. And how many of y'all are ready to have a funeral and die to self? So at the end of it, we're going to have a funeral. A friend of mine posted something on Facebook, and I emailed her. I said, I am stealing that and closing my message tonight with it. It was that powerful. She had a funeral for herself, and we're going to do the same thing. Remember our theme scripture is Ephesians 4, 5. There is one Lord. Come on, say it with me. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Church is a family affair. Amen? And it's not supposed to be one way. It's, the, it's God's way. It is a family. We've talked about it. You've been adopted into a brand new family. You are become joint heirs with Jesus. So everything the Father has becomes yours. It is totally brand new. You're part of something that's brand new. Remember in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. Something new had begun. Something was created that day that had never existed before, and it was called the church. And then when Jesus ascended on the throne, he did all that, and he became, when we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we became brand new creations, a brand new creature that had never existed before, so we could belong to this entity that never existed before, and we be, could become the sons and daughters of God and become part of a family that had never existed before. So let me tell you, you are a spirit, you are a soul that happens to live in a body. What you look like on the outside, what your skin reflects on the outside is not who you are. Who you are is your spirit man. Who you are is your soul. So if I'm a born-again child of God and you're a born-again child of God, when I look at you, I shouldn't see a big old tall giant black man. I see a son of God. Amen. Amen. Because who David is is not the house he's in. Amen. Who he is is who he is in God. Amen. So as children of God, we don't look at... Now, I love this whole saying that is, when I look at you, I don't see color. I look at him, I know he's a black man, right? Come on, we're not that stupid. We know what color the person is. The difference is if I treat you different because of what I see on the outside. But if I'm a child of God and he's a child of God, well, of course, if you're a child of God, you better not treat anybody different. You better love everybody. But when I look at you, what I need to see is what's on the inside of them. And if, if the person doesn't act right, 
then I need to just say, they need Jesus. Like I have a girlfriend who, when she sees a lady who's wearing some attire that she may not should be wearing because she, her body type shouldn't wear that outfit, she always looks at me and goes, she needs a friend. So when somebody doesn't treat you right or somebody doesn't act right, what you need to walk away and just go, they need Jesus and just keep on going. Don't let it affect you. Don't let it offend you. Don't let it make you carry an offense. Don't let it make you change the way you feel about everybody that happens to fit that body type to make you make you change what somebody says. Amen? Because we have got an important mandate from the Father to do. And that's what we're going to learn about tonight. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. He said, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by what? Godliness and dignity. He expects us to act different. He doesn't expect us to respond the same way somebody who's not in the kingdom would respond. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I have been chosen as a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating. I'm just telling the truth. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands. So you can't expect to dabble in sin. You can't expect to have unforgiveness. You can't expect to have bitterness. You can't expect to be offended and think you're going to lift up those hands to God and he's going to do something. That the anointing will be increased in your life. That the anointing will be in your life to help other people. Because God said you must lift them up. I want men everywhere and in every church to lift up holy hands to me. And then he says, lift up to God free from anger. But here's the clincher and controversy. See, we can't participate in what the world participates in. We can't let them dictate how I'm supposed to feel. We can't let an article dictate how I'm supposed to feel. I'm to pick up the word of God and read what he says. Well, he just said right here, he died for all men. That we become his. There's one Lord, one God, one faith. So I've got to funnel everything through there. There's a truth that Satan doesn't want you to know. Look at verse 5. There's one God, one mediator, who can reconcile God and humanity. That's Jesus. He's the only one that can fix this thing. Amen? It's not an forced acceptance of other people or of different lifestyles. Verse 4 says, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. It's God's will for every man, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter their past, to be reconciled to him. Now the thing is, once you become reconciled to God, then the next step is you've got to be reconciled to each other. You can't just say, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm a child of God, and I'm going to heaven, but there's only certain people I want to hang out with. Like, I only want to hang out with the Baptists. I don't want those crazy Pentecostals. Or I just want to hang out with the Pentecostals because they're just as spiritual as I am because they pray in tongues. I don't want to hang out with people who don't believe in it. That's not what he said. We've got to be reconciled to each other. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are my brother, you are my sister. And we all have the same goal, we should, and that's reconciling people back to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Because that's our purpose on this earth. It's not for what I can get. It's for what God wants us to do. 
We've placed a great deal on that first part of reconciling people back to Jesus. Man, we'll go out there and preach the gospel and get people born again. But if they don't fit the mold, we don't want to invite them to church. We don't want them to be our friend. We can't pick and choose who we want to invite to church. If they need Jesus, you need to invite them to church. Amen? So whoever it is, you've got to get them there. We've got, we've got to, we, we've, what we want to do is we want to accept Jesus but hold on to our preconceived ideas. Hold on to our past prejudices. Hold on to our past way of thinking. When I became born again, my way of thinking had to change. Remember the Bible says renew your mind and you have to do it by the word of God. That means the more I read the word of God, the more my mind changes the way it thinks. I no longer think the way I used to think. I start thinking the way God thinks. And like I said Sunday, then that changes the way I, when I start changing the way I think and I start thinking as God thinks, then now I start changing, I love what he loves and I hate what he hates. And so no matter what anybody says or what I hear, my thinking lines up with God. We've got to reconcile to each other. He didn't say there's only one mediator between God and man, but he said there's one mediator between God and men, plural. Not just a certain group. All, Asia, all nations, all ethnic groups, every one of them. Now, reconcile, I love this, it means to change mutually, to exchange. It means to bring back, to adjust. To change mutually means that we're making different in order to make the same. To sum it up, this is what it means. Reconciliation is the process of comparing differences, making adjustments, Bringing differences into balance and making things right are justifying the differences. So we may have different backgrounds, different upbringings, different ways we used to think, but yet when we become born again, we all come together and we make adjustments on what those thoughts are because we start lining up with the Word of God and then we come together and we function as one. That's what reconcile means. We do it all together. Justifying here me is the sense of restitution or making up for the difference. Christ makes up the difference between God's standards of righteousness and our own. Do you remember when Paul and Peter had that confrontation with each other? Paul said, listen, I'm a scholar. I've been trained by, by Gamaliel. I am like the highest one up there, man. I was trained by the best. I can t talk to the best of Pharisees and make an argument with them. But Peter... I need what you have in you. And together, we will be unstoppable. You may shine in one area and somebody else shines in the other, but when you put the two together, it's a force that people can't do. You've got people who are great organizers and people like just want to go for the goal. You know, I laugh because if you try to talk to mom about details, she's out of there. She wants it to work yesterday and to be done yesterday, but don't bore her with the details of how you're going to make that happen. Just get it done. But yet, if you talk to Dennis, don't give him the final product till he can figure out every detail to get to that final product. Okay, we need both. It's like dreamers and doers. you got to have them both. you got to have those people that can dream and dream big. But then you got to have the people that can actually make it happen and get the job done. That's the difference. We laugh at, at Josh and Michael when we're trying to prepare the creative team, that we're trying to prepare for something because Josh has these great, grandiose ideas, but he never gets in a hurry. Okay, you've got Dennis who usually helps him make the ideas come to life, who wants it done way ahead of time because he's a planner, he's a doer, and he wants it done perfect. And so you've got those two going each other, and then you've got Michael that just wants the easy way to get it done. So they were arguing up there one day for a Christmas project that they were getting done, and Michael says, Josh, you always want the Taj Mahal. And Josh goes, so you want the trailer park, so maybe together we can make it look good. <laughs> now, they're really not that bad, but you, you get what I'm trying to say. We need each other. So when you've got Dennis prodding them to get the job done yesterday, you've got Joshua that can dream and Michael that can make it happen. It all comes together and it's all beautiful. Even if it's 10 minutes before we start showtime, it's going to be done. 
But see, we all got to have each other. You've got to have all of us flowing together to make things happen. Amen? Then you've got, right after that, we got like the true reconciliation would involve making right any injustice or any inequality which may exist. This process is so complete in God that there's no evidence or trace of any difference ever existing. Listen, when you do it in God, by the time you get through, you don't even know there was ever any difference. When you think about that on Sundays when we come together, on Wednesdays when we come together, there is no evidence of difference. We're all one, flowing together for whatever the Holy Spirit wants done in this house. Amen? Is it, I love that. There's, it says, if there's no evidence of any separation whatsoever, there's no one-upmanship, there's no getting even, there's no grudges, there's no bringing up the past. It's all done and over with. Through Jesus, our mediator, the one, he's the only one that can bring true reconciliation, and he's the only one which can make it work. He's the only one that can remove all past differences that cause any alienation whatsoever. He's the only one that can remove any barriers or any distinctions that could cause us to be separate. He is the only one that can restore any rights or privileges necessary for the person to feel affirmed, for the person to feel justified. He's the only one that can take care of that. He's the only one that can make someone who feels inferior and insecure feel right in him. He's the only one that can remove fear from somebody who has fear. Jesus is the only one that can do that. Man, if you're walking around rejected, if you're walking around with an inferiority complex, there is no man, no man. I'm talking about just a physical person. There is no woman, there is no man that could ever fix that for you. Jesus is the only one that could do it. And it's when we look for our affirmation, when we look for our our, our um. Uh, justification when we look for something on this side that that's when we get in trouble but when we look to God to be set free from those feelings then we become like he wants us to become he's the only one that can take care of it when you do anything listen to me when you do anything that causes separation or causes division whether you knowingly do it or unknowingly do it you are creating the position of being the mediator that's not our place. I'm telling you, with, with Facebook, with Twitter, with Instagram, before you say or post anything, you need to sit on it, and you need to say, God, is this going to bring, um, is this going to bring oneness, or will this cause separation? And sometimes it's not so much what you say, but it's all the comments up underneath it. So if you know that something you're going to say is going to cause all these people to make comments underneath that's going to cause division to be any better, leave it alone. Or if you find out you did it real quick, just delete it. Don't put an explanation on Facebook because all you're going to do is create more comments to come up underneath it. Delete it. Say, Lord, I am sorry. I didn't mean to cause any division. Because I'm telling you, division hinders the anointing. Separation makes that gap where the anointing can't flow like it wants to flow. I don't know about you, but nothing's worth the anointing not being on my life. Nothing is worth me not being able to walk in somebody's room and lay hands on them and the anointing of God flow through me to them for them to be set free. It's not worth it. Amen? So, so we don't want to do that. Galatians 3, verse 29 says, And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promises to Abraham belongs to you. A mediator has to be one who is taken from among and can fairly represent all people. Jesus can mediate between God and man because he was both. He was God who became man. He's justified to be our mediator. He can represent all men because he came from all men, and he is called the Son of Man. Being the son of man, he can demand forgiveness and settle disputes among the races and the ethnic group. Being the seed of Abraham, the father of our faith, he can confer 
heirship upon all people, given full equality, privilege, and the right to all who are his. If we could only understand this truth, all strife, do you hear me? All strife between races, all strife between any other group, all strife between other denominations, all strife between anybody would stop immediately. You're Abraham's seed. You're Abraham's seed. You're Abraham's seed. We're all part of Abraham. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 8 verse 6 says, But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. In Acts chapter 17 verse 26, out of the Amplifies, it says this, He made from one, from one common origin, one source, one blood, all nations of men to settle on the face of the earth. All groups, all ethnic groups, no matter what you came from, no matter where you think your lineage is, all came from one person. That's Adam. So you can do your little DNA testing all you want to. You're going to find out your kin to somebody who ain't the same color as you. Because we all came from Adam. And that lineage was passed all the way down. So literally, whether spiritually or not, we're all brothers and sisters. Amen? So we, all of us came from that. All men came. Therefore, man's greatest need was redemption because with it came the sin nature also because Adam fell. And in Genesis chapter 6, we see where God became e the, the world became even more wicked than it had previously since Adam sinned causing God to, cut God to cut back on the length of time we were on this earth. I mean, back then they lived 800, 900 years. God said, listen, they are so daggone wicked that their 800 years needs to be cut even shorter because they could get into all kind of mess even longer. I leave them on here. Amen? So he had to cut back the length. Can sin continued this rampage. Then God decided he was going to judge the earth, and he sent a flood. Because the wickedness had gotten so bad. We always, I laugh now because we always think, man, it could be as bad as it is now. It was so wicked, he destroyed the earth. It had to be pretty bad. But from Noah, they saved Noah and his family. And from Noah's three sons came the three major ethnic groups of the world. Three different groups, but they still were of one blood, the blood of Adam. They still spoke the same language. And we find nothing that they had set their mind to has become impossible to them. Because they all spoke the same. So God had to divide them and he had to separate them. Now, the, pro the reason that God did the separation is because he knew that being one would make them, everything, everything would be possible. So they could do anything they wanted to at that point. He had to separate them somehow. But another reason he separated them is because when you isolate people and you put them all separate, they've got to seek God because all the answers aren't in themselves. So they have to, when, when you, you begin to be thinking on the inside, you discover your own weaknesses, you discover your own handicaps, and you seek God. God's intention was for man to seek him so he would find him. He was never hiding he never not wanted to be found. He always wanted man. If you think about it, why did he even create us? He wanted fellowship, right? So he didn't hide from us. Our sin caused us to hide from him. But we had to, we always looked for him. I love the fact, everybody says, well, what if, what if somebody doesn't hear the gospel of Jesus? Well, God made it so wonderful that if you are truly seeking him, you will find him. You'll find him in creation. You'll find him somewhere. You may not have the gospel message down the way we said it, but you will find God because he has opened himself up for all mankind, not just some. Amen? So you're going to find him. And then the solitude or the isolation eliminates distractions, giving man full opportunity to seek God. Now, here's the thing. Once a pure seed secured through the seed of Abraham... With the birth of Jesus, there was no longer any need for separation. His, com his conversation with the woman at the well in John 4 confirmed that. Because now all it was law. God set the law in motion. The Israelites had to be separate. They couldn't mingle with everybody else. They had, he had to do that to preserve the lineage that Jesus Christ was going to be born into. 
But once Jesus came, say, but Jesus. When he came, listen, when Jesus came, that needs for separation no longer existed. He had been born. The lineage had been preserved. And now he's talking to somebody. You can understand why they got that little attitude that they were better than everybody else because they're the only ones that had a covenant with God. But when Jesus came, he said, uh-uh, that attitude's got to go because I've done more than just become your Savior. I have reconciled all men unto God, not just one. And the gospel was open to the Gentiles. Thank you, Jesus, the gospel was open to us Gentiles. And Jesus said, listen, I know that you're a dog. I know that you're a a Samaritan. I know we're not supposed to be talking to you, but I'm here now. Amen? I'm here now. I'm the one that when you drink from my well, you'll never thirst again. Look at John 4, verse 21. Jesus said, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will be no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. In other words, it's going to come a dime. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your background is. There's going to come a time you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Say, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Aren't you glad the time is now? Amen? When we all worship him with one spirit, we all worship him as one Because that's what we do. My spirit, man. I love what mom says, though. When I worship God, just like when I sin, when I sin, it affects not just my spirit. It affects my flesh, too. Every part of me gets involved in it. So when I become born again and I start worshiping him, I want more than just my spirit to worship him. I want my mind, my soul, my body. I want every part of me to worship him. That's why you got to get into it, man. I don't care if I'm not that demonstrative. Well, let me watch you at a football game. Let me see you at a basketball game. Now, I know there are some people who don't get excited about anything. But nine times out of ten, most of you who say, well, I'm jumping on the inside. You lie because I see you at a football game and you're jumping up and down and screaming. But my Lord, if you can get that excited. I said, if I can get that excited over brown pig skin on the ground that some man is rolling with, how can I not get excited in the throne room of Almighty God who has redeemed me and set me free? Amen? Who has reconciled me back to the Father, reconciled me back to my brothers and sisters in Christ. How can I not be demonstrative in my worship of Him? Come on. Man, when we're singing those songs, I get excited. It's exciting to think about what God's done for us. He announced a new circumcision, a new way of identifying God's people that transcended any race, that transcended any background, that transcends anything. He declared God is the Spirit, so those who worship Him must also do that. God wanted all people to know the Messiah and to worship Him. And there is peace between everybody in Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. He's like, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. I love that, man. You might have paraded around that you were circumcised, but it didn't do anything but mark your body. It did nothing for your heart. And then he said in verse 12, In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far off from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. Christ himself has brought peace. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people 
from the two groups. I am now part of that new people. Amen? Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Woo, I love that. Our hostility to one another was put to death. In Jesus, it should not be there. Amen? He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together. Say together. We are his house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone of Christ himself. We are carefully joined together in him. Becoming a holy temple of the Lord. Through him. You Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by spirit. I love that. In our flesh, we're different. We're separate. But verse 14 said, he became our peace. He made us one. He's broken down that wall of partition that separated us. See, God first, he tore that veil that separated God and man. And then all of a sudden he brought peace in and then he tore that wall of separation between us and them. There is no more us and them. All there is is one. He made us in him one new people. I love that. To worship him together. Together we become one holy race before God. I love that. In verse 15, he made, he created himself one new man. You can call it a new race. You can call it a new ethnic group. You can call it whatever you want to. I'm brand new. Amen. I'm a new people in Christ Jesus. Peace has been made between us. Christ, God in Christ created a new creature, not known after the flesh, but known after the spirit. Verse 16 said that he reconciled all the races together. See, Paul spent his whole time saying, listen, don't try to make the Gentiles like Jews. And don't try to be Jews. Try to be Gentiles. Be the new holy race that you are called to be. That means the Gentiles had to let go of their gods. The Jews had to let go of their circumcision. And they had to come together and worship God the way he wanted to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Everything else they did was according to the flesh. The flesh made me this. The flesh made me that. God said, get rid of what the flesh has made you and realize what the spirit has made you. Because that's what matters in him. Amen? Peace has been there. We're to worship him all together. And after Jesus, no race has a monopoly. No race has an access to God above anything else. No race has uh, an instinct in his covenants. And no race has promises that are better than anybody else. We are all equal in him. Aren't you glad of that? Hallelujah. I love that he said, he told the Gentiles, there's no more going to Jerusalem and you acting like second class, class citizens. You are just as classy as they are. Amen. No more sitting in the balcony or the outer court. I love Romans 8, 17 says, As long as we have faith in Christ, we've become adopted into the family of Abraham. We are heirs and joint heirs. Reconciliation puts everyone on an equal basis. See, when you become born again, God said he's given every single one of us a measure of faith. That means all of us start out exactly the same. The difference is, what are you doing with that part faith that he gave you? What are you doing with it? Are you making it grow? Are you letting it sit on it and get stagnant? Are you getting in this work? Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Are you getting in his presence? Are you getting in his word? Are you taking that measure of faith he gave you and growing it? Are you changing the way you think? Are you changing the way you act? I'm going to tell you how you can tell. When you look at a certain thing, if you look up at the stage, are you counting how many black people and how many white people there are? Come on, I'm locating it. 
Because if everything you look at is look through the eyes of what is equal or not equal or what color race is, that's not what we go by. We go by what's on the inside and the call of God on somebody. You don't ever look at color. You don't ever look at skin to determine what things are. You look at God to determine that. If you go somewhere and you're always offended, could it be that there's so much offense in you that you run into it everywhere? Because I'm telling you, when I go places, I don't think that way. If I happen to be walking through a door and a black man is in front of me and he closes the door on me, I don't think, oh, I'm a white girl, he did that. I think automatically, my first thing is, he didn't see me. Because I don't think people walk around to be rude. My first response is, he didn't see me. Or if he did see me, I just think, oh, he's just rude. My first thought shouldn't be he did it because of the color of my skin. Because it's not in me, I don't automatically think that way. So if everywhere you go, that thought's coming to your head, you need to check yourself, Lord, is that in me? Now, I'm not saying you'll never run into it and it's not in you. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if it's an everyday thing with you that you're being offended that way, check yourself. And make sure it's not in you. Amen? Because I was telling Kippy when a whole bunch of stuff was going on in the world and things were happening. And I, we were traveling and I stopped somewhere and I walked in the store and I was the only white girl in the store. And everybody was sweet and everybody was nice and I had, we had conversations. And I looked at Kippy and I said, see, all that crap is a lie from the devil. It's a lie. People aren't like what they're projecting that people are like. Everybody wants to love everybody. Everybody wants to be together. So don't feed the lie that Satan is feeding you. Amen? Most 90% of people are nice people. And they don't get rid of, they don't listen to junk. So don't feed anything that's going to make your thought process go anywhere that will cause separation. In the natural and in, in the spirit realm. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Amen? We can't allow, allow the pull of the world to dictate our choices. We can't let it sway our opinions. We can't get it to cause us to look one way to be offended or not. Folks, 90% of what you see on TV is a small little clip of, an, of information that happened that they want to make into something big. We don't know everything because we weren't there. So you need to pray, amen, and you need to let God take care of it. That's not what we, what we do. The hope of the entire world hinges upon the church. And it's time for us to get rid of our pettiness, get rid of our offense, and realize that we are called to be the church. We have the answer. And if we can't get our attitudes right, how are we going to tell a world about a loving Jesus? So we've got to get things right. Everything hinges upon the church committing, communicating the great truth of 1 Timothy. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, and that's the man Christ Jesus. That's everything. So I'm not willing to have anything in my life that's going to make me view a brother and sister in a different way than underneath the way Jesus sees them. Because I've got to communicate to the world that there's one God and one mediator that reconciles everything, that fulfills every void in your life, that lifts you up when you're down, that heals you when you're sick, that delivers you when you need, that can be your comforter when you need to be comforted. He could be anything and everything you need him to be, but I've got to be able to communicate that to you, and I can't do that if I let junk come in me to change the way I view somebody. You can't do it. You've got to be true to what God wants you to do. It's time for us to bury the old man and come up brand new. Amen. It's time for us to have a funeral. Y'all ready to have one? Amen. Now listen, now y'all remember Tina Coggins? You know, the country girl? Hey, y'all. I miss them. She posted this today, and I'm going to read it to you. If you want a copy of it, we made some copies for you back there. She said, listen, pray for me as I attend a funeral today. Who died? Me. 
I know some will think that I have lost my ever-loving mind with this post, but I know some will totally get it. I do some of my best thinking while making the bed. So this morning I'm making the bed, and in my spirit I hear, throw yourself a funeral and don't wait till the end of your earthly life. Yep, that's what was impressed upon me. I started thinking about all the dead things that I have carried around all my life that have been killing me. At times it's been a lack of trust in the Lord that he will come through for me. Sometimes it's been someone or something that I just couldn't get over the words that were spoken over me. Sometimes I'm paralyzed because I couldn't forgive myself when I sinned and made a wrong choice. Often it's been disappointments that a plan or a dream fell through. It can be wrong thoughts or lies that I've taken on to be truth. So today I am sitting and making my funeral arrangements because I want to live, really live. I have a meeting with the uptaker, God, instead of the undertaker, to make plans on how we're going to conduct this funeral. The viewing is an open casket type thing where I am visible and transparent before God. My hearst is going to be the angels that watch over me. God has given them charge over me. I'm going out and buying a, pair, uh, a plant or a small bouquet of flowers to remember this day. Instead of a eulogy from family and friends, I'm going to the word of God to find out what God t feels about me. And I'm going to proclaim that out loud. I'm going to play one of my favorite worship songs and think about all that God has done for me. It's going to be done with, and I'm going to close the lid on all the dead things that have held me back from really living. And she put prayer in parentheses. I think I'll give a gift in honor of someone, do a kind deed, write a note of encouragement. I'm going to enjoy a good meal and celebrate my life. I got to attend my own funeral today. This has been one of the best times of my life. John eleven twenty five 25 says, The one who believes in me will live even though they die. At this rate, she said, Hey, at this rate, funerals might just be one of my favorite things to attend. Well, at least mine anyway. <laughs> so how many of y'all ready to have a funeral today? To bury that old man, let's lay transparent before the Father and say, Lord, if there's any of that stuff in me that I didn't even realize within me, because sometimes we can carry it on and say it and do it without even really realizing being fully conscious of that's really what's on inside of me. But it's time to let it go. It's time to get rid of it. It's time to bury it. Amen. I love this. There's some of you out there, and some of you may want to carry this out and just physically say, Lord, I'm having a funeral today, and I'm laying open, transparent before you because I don't want this stuff in me. Amen? Amen. So repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I thank you that today my physical man dies. My, man dies. my spirit man has been raised up in you. Father, I will think like you, act like you, Love like you and tell other people how good you are. I renounce any prejudice in my life. I relate any, any spirit of inferiority. I renounce any spirit of rejection. I renounce any spirit of racism. And Father, I say your spirit rules and reigns. In my life, in the name of Jesus, amen, hallelujah, glory. So let's do our confession. Are y'all ready? All right, the love which God loves him is in me. The very love that created this universe, the compassion of God himself, is living inside of me, giving me the power to love like he loves. I can love my family, my neighbors, my church, and the whole world with God's love. Hallelujah. Thank you all so much for being here. Make, you, make sure you tell a couple people you're a new person today. Amen.